Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy, episode 368 for March 10th of 2017. Who's your favorite Julia? Child, Roberts, or Alfa Romeo? Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Well, welcome everybody to AutoLine After Hours. I've got Mark Phelan from the Detroit Free Press riding shotgun with me today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, John. Gary Vassalash, who, of course, is the co-host of the show, uh, at this moment is probably on an airplane flying back from the Geneva Motor Show. So that's why Gary's not here on the show today. But great to have you here, Mark. Thank you. And I've got to let everybody know we got Rory Carroll from Auto Week here with us as well. And, Rory, great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And, uh, of course, the reason I got both these guys is our special guest today, and you're going to help me throw a bunch of questions at him, is Peter Hogeveen, and you are the director of Alfa Romeo North America. Welcome to After Hours. Thank you. I got the best job in the world, so <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> well, you got a big hill in front of you. I mean, you, you got to build this whole brand back up in North America, and it's been a long time since it's been here. What are your first priorities? I think the first priority for us is to build awareness for the brand, obviously. As you mentioned, uh, we've been out of the market from a you know, volume vehicle since 95. Obviously, the Alfa Romeo 4C has done its part, you know, reintroducing Alfa Romeo to North America. So, speaking to that point, obviously, our Super Bowl commercials that we aired, you know, already over 25 million views, has really helped drive that passion for Alfa, the interest for the brand as well. So, that is obviously number one. And obviously, number two is for us is to build a good, you know, a dealer network. We currently have 167 dealers in the United States. We've got to keep, uh, continue to build that, find the right partners, and, uh, you know, then obviously ship the vehicles over here and what we've been hearing and what we saw last month already there's a lot of interest not only from people want to learn about the brand but also you know really uh, people in the market to buy uh, to buy Alfa Romeo so we're, we're very excited with the Giulia and as I mentioned you know Giulia is going to set us up for uh, Alfa Stelvio coming later this summer so a lot of exciting times like I said by the best world uh, best job in the world in my opinion because uh, um, you know we're all we're all starting from from the ground up here and uh, you know the excitement is there the passion is there so I'm very fortunate to be part of that. And about how many Julias have you delivered uh, so far? So we're around 500 uh, Julias uh, so far we've delivered. Um, obviously, we launched the brand um, in, at first with the Quattrofolio, you know, the vehicle we were fortunate enough to have in the studio here, which is our high-horsepower vehicle. Last month was really our first month that we got good sales on the, uh, uh, the Julia and the Julia Ti, so our 2-liter, 280-horsepower version, which, you know, obviously there was a lot of traffic for that as well. So uh, last, last month we sold uh, over 410 units of those as well. So... Good traffic, good interest, so uh, that's, that's what we have out so far. And is the TI expected to be most of the sales? Um, I think what we'll, we'll see is, uh, uh, based on the packaging, I think TI will be our volume model. Um, obviously, it's available, like the Julia, with a rear-wheel drive and an all-wheel drive configuration, so we expect about a 50-50 split. Um, and yeah, the TI will be the, will be the most popular. And then we have the sport group on the vehicle, which actually is pretty cool because it makes the car look like a Quattrofolio. It's got the five hole wheels that we see in the Quattrofolio with the sport fascia front and rear. And we already see from dealer orders and customer interest that will probably be our high runner. And, and for people who haven't been uh, following really closely at home, the TI's got the 2-liter turbo, about 285 horsepower? That's correct, 280 horsepower, so it will be best-in-class horsepower. It's got 306 foot-pound of torque, which is obviously very impressive as well coming out of the 2-liter uh, the engine. So it's a turbocharged direct injection engine, 280 horsepower, and um, you know, 0 to 16, 5.1 seconds. So, you know, also the fastest in the segment. So it's uh, what people expect from an Alfa Romeo, obviously. Sure. Is that is that kind of where you're going to hang your hat as far as uh, brand positioning, uh, performance, and and kind of raw numbers, or, or tell me a little bit about that. That's a that's a good question because you know zero to sixty is always these stats that you easily throw out there. And um, what is more difficult to talk about is obviously how the vehicle handles and how the vehicle performs. So, but the strength is with the Julia is that when the Julia was developed, it was developed as a Quattrofolio, the 505 horsepower vehicle. But a lot of that technology was brought down to the Julia and the Julia Ti. So the direct steering, obviously the all unique 
uh, Giorgio platform, which is the basis for the, for the Julia, and then the all aluminum suspension. So it's more about handling. It's all about driver-centric, though. The whole cockpit, as you can see, it's set up. It's all about staying in control with the larger paddles on the steering column. But, yes, it's more than just 0 to 60. And I think we've proven that when we took the Julia to the Nuremberg Ring, yeah. you know, and obviously set our record time. You know, there's probably not a more demanding track in the world than the Nuremberg Ring, where we set our record time of 7 minutes and 32 seconds, really emphasizing on it's more than just straight power, for sure. Have you looked at uh, what are your goals for conquest and that kind of stuff? So, so but, we, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll kind of clarify that a little bit. So we have our staff is super young. It's all these. Uh, I think the guys who are driving cars right now are reviewing cars, guys and girls. I think most of them are under 30 years old. We had a uh, quadrifolio in the office um, a week ago, and we talked about it a little bit. We, you know, we have a staff meeting where we talk about these cars, and this thing was all anybody wanted to talk about. They're completely in love with the car, and they're really trying to um, make the case that if you were thinking about getting an M4 this year, if you're thinking, or an M3 this mm -hmm. year, uh, if you're thinking about Mercedes or, or Audi, you have to drive this car. So I think from, from our perspective or from a lot of people's perspective, who've driven the car, the car drives well enough to be in that, in that conversation. How do you make the step, I guess, from, from us saying that yep. uh, to actually conquesting, and then what are your goals for that? That's actually a, a very good question, because obviously the vehicle is there, the product is there. Um, as I mentioned before, the awareness is obviously when your new brand is difficult. So what you'll see from Alfa Romeo moving forward a lot more is drive events. We're going to make sure that we... It's not just going to an auto show and offer a ride and drive. We're going to do a lot of partnership with lifestyle events. So mm. we're the younger crowd. We just finished one in California um, called Modernism Week, a big architecture um, event. We had over 350 test drives. Mm -hmm. that, those are events that we're going to go to where the buyers are going to give them an opportunity to experience the vehicle because... Hey, at the end of the day, I want them to build a relationship with the dealership. You know, that's where they're going to come back. That's where they're going to buy their second car. But we have a good opportunity by very strategic events to put people behind the wheel because we know how well the car drives and performs. So that's one of the strategies we obviously do. And then from a conquest perspective as well, you know, we have... We encourage our dealers, obviously, to be very aggressive at advertising as well, to, to drive their local traffic uh, to dealerships. So, but you'll see a lot of our, you know, dealer partners own larger auto groups. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously, they're used to... Uh, uh, you know, selling these premium vehicles, and then it's all about the customer experience. So we really work hard on, like, when a customer walks into the Alfa Romeo dealership, it's got to be the experience that they're used to. So mm -hmm. we begin with getting people in, in the seats to get that experience, and then obviously we try to uh, bring it down as much as possible to bring them in contact with the dealership. I would agree with your strategy, because i got to tell you, until you get in the car, you really don't appreciate how good it is. Yep. It, it is a car you have to drive to realize how good it is. But we got a good question here from Jim Adcock that just came in from Yakima, Washington. And he's got a question I think a lot of people are asking themselves about. Poor service and reliability. The brand's had a history of that. Now, I know that goes way back, but the perception's still there. And he wants to know, what are you going to be doing about that so that when people come in and drive the car and love it, they know that they're going to have reliability and good service. I think, Jim, that's a good question. Obviously, that's something we got to overcome. We're, uh, we're not naive to this, obviously. So first of all, from a warranty perspective, we're right in line with the competition. You know, we have a four-year, 50,000-mile warranty on the vehicle. Hey, let's hope they never have to use it, correct? If you look at the technology and the features we use, there's a lot of high-end technology in the vehicle, but there's also been a lot of durability testing done, quality testing on the vehicle as well. So, for example, for my infotainment partners, you know, we're working closely with Magneti Morelli, developing a system that is simple, reliable, intuitive. There's nothing in there that is unnecessary, just to keep it focus-based. But um, when a customer buys a vehicle from Alfa Romeo, we make sure that the first service is on us. So you come back to the dealership. One of the reasons is to like, bring, get the contact, customer in contact with the dealership again. If there's anything they're concerned about, we can then tackle right there at that point. But uh, something to overcome. We're very well aware that you know, still one of the top purchase reasons in the segment is quality and reliability. And honestly, I'd say time will tell for us, obviously. But, you know, there's a lot of money. At, um, as Mr. Marchioni also mentioned before, this is a platform we invested $5 billion in. You know, obviously, that's, uh, there's a lot of commitment from us at Alfa Romeo to make sure it's a, it's a reliable vehicle. And what we've seen so far, the feedback has been really good in the car. Again, I realize we just got in the market as well. But. Mm -hmm.
The, the people who have purchased so far, are they mostly people who had owned Alphas in the past or new buyers who would you know, just like the looks of the brand? Is it a mix? You know, who, who's coming to your dealership? So that is a good question. Um, I'm going off dealer feedback at this point because obviously I don't have the story on every customer that buys the car. So we, have, uh, we survey every customer that buys a car from us and then obviously we get feedback from the dealers. There's a lot of interest from people that currently own Audi, BMW and Mercedes like we expected. A lot of conquest. Uh, this segment is about 70% lease. So a lot of people getting out on their lease, like, hey, you know what, I'm going to lease another Alpha. Kind of maybe speak to Jim's point. Let's, let's try out the brand for a couple of years and see how it holds up. So we see a lot of conquests come in. But if I have to, based on the feedback I receive from dealers, there have been a lot of people waiting for the brand to return. So I think a large portion of the Alfa Romeo Giulia sales you see today, and especially the Quattrofolio, there's a lot of people that own Ferraris or other vehicles or older Alfa Romeos that are highly collectible that have been waiting for the Quattrofolio to come back. And speaking of people who've owned Ferraris and the like, one of the things that, that I think helps Alfa with people who aren't familiar with the brand is that you do you know, point out that the engine was developed in cooperation with Ferrari. Going forward, will that sort of cooperation continue to exist or does the fact that Ferrari's been spun off make it less likely that there can be some engineering cross-pollination? So I, I, that's a good question but I think if you take a look at what Alfa Romeo is the team when it started they, they grabbed two lead, uh, uh, lead engineers from Ferrari to set up the whole team so just simply based on that there will always be a Ferrari DNA in the brand. Look historically at the brand obviously Enzo Ferrari started with Alfa Romeo you know racing vehicles so there will always be a close uh, close relationship there as well. Um, you know, we're very fortunate we're able to uh, utilize their expertise on the development of the Giorgio platform as well as our 2.9 liter V6. And even if you take a look at our multi-air injection system, that came straight from Formula One as well. So I think... Uh, and your steering wheel. And the steering wheel, <laughs> correct, yeah, with the, with the push button a start. wonderful push button start on it, yeah. That's correct. So yeah, no, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we always see where we can find efficiencies. And, you know, again, we got to make sure that Alpha stays true to delivering the driving vehicle that we all agree on that Alfa Romeo is. So. And so what do you tell the guy who, who is driving an M3 now? I'm very interested in this Conquest question. Yeah, as, you as, can bring it up. But, uh, yeah. So what do you tell that guy? If he's, if he's on the fence now, if he's, if he's uh, thinking about maybe something a little bit more distinctive, then, then what do you say? I mean, what's, what's the case for Alfa? So I think what we would tell the, guy, the person, like I said earlier, drive the car, correct? That's yeah. when we're going to have our ride and drive uh, events as well. But to be more realistic, I mean, I think it's in the numbers, but I also want to speak to you guys. I mean, the reviews you put in magazines, I think, say it best, correct? Yeah. If you put them head to head, the Julia does come out best in many cases. So, you know, obviously we know people that buy, M, you know, the M3s, let's use M3 or an AMG as an example, yeah. they read the buff books, they read the magazines. So we make sure that, you know, obviously through your honest opinion that, uh, you know, what we've seen that the feedback has been really good and it's more than just the numbers, but in the numbers, obviously, we, we beat them as well. So, and that was very important for Alfa Romeo from a positioning perspective. It's very it. interesting. I mean, I think, you know, people, so I'm almost in the demographic. I'm, <laughs> I'm just a year shy or two. Um, but I think, so my exposure to Alfa Romeo is, is minimal. I mean, is historic. So mm -hmm. it's old cars, it's GTVs and friends who own classic Alfa Romeos. But I don't really remember Alpha being in the market at all. Um, you know, I, I remember seeing seeing the cars around, the older cars, but I don't remember being Alpha dealerships. I don't remember ever oh. seeing like. Right. Um, so it's an interesting question from a marketing standpoint, or from a, a sales standpoint, to really be able to say you have a ton of freedom there because you know your demographic. If you're saying the 35 to 45, probably most of those people don't have a lot of experience with Alfa Romeo or maybe just experience the tail end of the brand. So it's a really interesting... And it's good and bad, correct? For yeah. us, it's good because, to your point, we can tell the story. What is important, as I indicated earlier, we got to make sure we find the people. They're not going right. to come to us. So that's why I mentioned you know, the partnership and lifestyle events, just making sure. And also, if you look at the demographic, you know, the customer today, it's all about time. It's you got to be at the right place at the right time. People mm -hmm. are not going to go out of their way and shop vehicles for three and a half days. You know, they do the majority online. Mm -hmm. If we can entice them there, we got to make sure we find them somewhere else. But I think people want to learn on their own. We're, we're, we rely heavily on brand ambassadors. You know, it might be an overused word in the industry, but, you know, hearsay, you know, you have a lot of blogs, you know, people that love sharing their stories on the vehicles. And what we see today in Alpha already, there's a lot of, you know, obviously we watch the blogs and we monitor what's going on. There's a lot of good talk and recommendations. I mean, simply said in our Facebook page, you know, when we post something on a, on a Julia, people start automatically posting their pictures of seeing one or, you know, you know fortune, some of fortune of having one and then share their stories as well. So we've got to make sure we tell the story. But as I said earlier, this vehicle has to be driven. And that's what we encourage our dealers to do as well. You know, make sure you have 
a good fleet of test drive vehicles available. So when a customer wants to drive the car, you know, make sure you do it because the car will sell itself. It's very interesting. You mentioned earlier that you did the Super Bowl ads. What led you to that? And that's a very gutsy move. There must have been a lot of discussion in the company about spending that kind of money on a brand that's just getting going again. Correct. So obviously, you know, we have one of the best creative minds in the industry, with Mr. Olivier Francois, uh, working for FCA. And I think what, but it was really important for us because the time was right. We literally were shipping cars as the Super Bowl commercials went on. So it was like, uh, you know, for us, it worked out perfect. You know, the timing was right. The spots were right, too, because we really took time to tell the Alpha story. You know, kind of like we started off with the, the riding dragons kind of, you know, drive that passion. And then if you look at the Dear Predictable spot we played later, it was all about saying what we know is happening in industry based on research, people are kind of tired of what they have today. So let's 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 find an alternative. And obviously our last spot, Mozza Fiato, really spoke to that Italian passion. Like that's one of the things too we have going for us from a positioning perspective is like, you know, we're made in Italy. You know, we're designed in Italy, we're made in Italy, and that's something to be really exciting about. So we want to make sure we get that out. And based on you know the, the views we've received and the dealer traffic we've had from it, the timing was perfect. But to your point, it's always a big risk to, to go out uh, uh, to start that way for us. But lunch timing was perfect. Hey, look, we got to take a quick break right now. We got a lot more to talk to you about uh, on Alfa Romeo. But uh, right now, Carmen, I believe we're giving a shout out to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back talking with Peter Hogeveen, the director for Alfa Romeo North America. Another question just came in from Armand. You've got a lot of background in dealerships. He wants to know, how are you going to make the dealership experience unique? And can you give us any examples? You, you mentioned about having uh, demo cars there for everybody yep. to be able to get a test drive. So what is important that, you know, in dealership, the experience of the customer, we all know time. It's very, very important. People don't want to spend time at a dealership, you know, maybe when you shop a vehicle, but you do it on your own time when you're in a dealership for service. So one of the things that we are working on is a completely digital experience. Everything you buy today, it's done digitally through an iPad or anything. So we're, we're uh, working on introducing a completely digital service program. So the customer gets there, the iPad will recognize the vehicle, you scan the vehicle, all the information is there. You sign on an iPad and then you get in and out as soon as possible. But also, of course, courtesy transportation vehicles. Like when you bring your vehicle, is there another alpha for me to leave in? You know, that's, a, that's for, obviously selfishly for me very important to make sure we continue to keep people in Alfa Romeos. But again, it's all about time and efficiency and we make a clear differentiation in our showroom as well. If we have a shared showroom with Maserati or a shared showroom with Fiat, in some cases, we make sure that it's very clear uh, separation between the brands because building that brand identity and especially being an Italian company, it's all about the touch, the feel, the look. It's very, very important we continue to uh, communicate that. And you, you're launching with the Giulia, of course, but yep. you've got the Stelvio SUV coming later. With the direction that the U.S. market is going, I've been assuming that the Stelvio will be the uh, bigger seller of the two. Is that accurate? And do you expect it to appeal to the same buyer profile, or will it uh, get uh, more female buyers? You know, what, what are the expectations? So I think if you look at the industry, um, the, the, the premium midsize sedan is still larger than the premium midsize UV. But if you look at it from a growth perspective, I mean, the premium midsize size UV grew 27% last year. So there's a lot of growth going on. A lot of people are exiting the sedan and now moving into the, the, the UV segment. So again, you know, speaking of perfect timing, for us it's good timing. You know, the car will be in market late summer. So hopefully, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get a, a good wave for that as well. And we, and we expect the segment to continue to grow. The buyer will be close to the same. Obviously, the majority of our buyers are going to, you know, are going to be new to the brand. But what I think, uh, I think to your point, the, the female demographic is larger in this in this segment for sure. I mean, it's just a just a fact based on what we see from uh, competitive sales data. So, um, but it's important for us. But we still want to make sure we speak to that DNA of Alfa Romeo when you drive the vehicle. So, the quadrifolio that we have here today in the studio with us, our high horsepower vehicle. We will also have a quadrifolio version, obviously, on our on our Stelvio. And not just we didn't just put a bigger engine in it. It's also going to deliver to those driving dynamics that we we spoke about earlier. And then, obviously, from a, a handling and driving perspective, even on a, on a Stelvio and a Stelvio Ti, we want to make sure we continue to, to stay true to that DNA. So it's not just a UV from Alpha, because the market is hot. 
it should be a UV that speaks to Alfa Romeo. And I think we say in our taglines, you know, it's an SUV made for the S curves. We want to make sure we, we speak to the driving dynamics. So, speaking of heritage, uh, Alfa Romeo, great motorsports heritage. Yep. Uh, more than 100 years, right? Yeah, 106. Some ago. of the most interesting, uh, attractive, successful race cars of all time. When are we going to see you back on a racetrack? So I think, um, you know, I mean, I, I, you're probably alluding to uh, Formula One racing or like the big racetrack, obviously. It'd be great. I mean, we started in Formula One. Unfortunately, I can't speak to that. That is something that is not sure. decided that, uh, in my job. But uh, I'm a big Formula One fan myself. So I would love to, yeah, for sure. So and then, you know, obviously, if you if you watch Formula One, you can see the Alfa Romeo logo on the Ferrari as well. Yep. So I think it speaks true to the, you know, the, the racing history. And uh, I th this should be on an IMSA track, don't you think? I mean, b before... Yeah. Before too long, I would I would imagine that has to be if you if you want a GT3 version. Yeah, I mean if, I think if you want to play in that in that space with the AMGs and the M cars and they're going to expect you to come out there and beat them. I mean, correct. I mean I, I think that's that's a, that's a fair point to make. We've even seen our owners already working on you know putting yeah. the vehicle in race series as well. And I think that you know it is the vehicle to do it because this is a you know a truly performance sedan. I mean there's there's no question about it. I mean you've driven it yourself. Yeah. So, so you're committing to a racing program? I'm not committing no. to a racing program. No. <laughs> I, I wish I could. No, yeah. I wish I had the power. No, that's obviously not decided at uh, my level. But uh, hey, you know, racing heritage is something you know that we tout, that we show in all our communications. I mean, all the, the spots you see from us or any sure. positioning we do, we always speak very highly, you know, or always reflect our racing heritage because it's it's one that is almost unmatched in the industry. So. Good. I'll be looking forward to it. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> hey, we got a, a phone call that just came in. Carmen, why don't we bring that in? Hi, John, Gary, and guests. Uh, this is Dale Leonard in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, my question is, back in the day, I had an Alpha Spider, which was an absolute dream to drive. And I know you can't talk about future product, but I was wondering if uh, a Spider might be in the lineup again to uh, bring to the United States. Thank you. Wonderful show as always. Take care. I bet I like. you get a million questions about the Spider. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, the Alpha Duetos, you know, the Spider, you know, he's referring to, uh, I think, you know, even based on historical values or values now in the market, there's a huge demand for Alpha Romeo convertibles. Hey, if, if you take a look at what, uh, you know, FCA, we obviously just introduced uh, the 124 Spider. Um, let's launch Julia, let's launch Stelvio, and then uh, we'll look at uh, what, what we got coming in the future. It's been interesting to me to see, and I, I saw this a little bit with Jaguar, but as the Alpha brand kind of reasserts itself in the United States and, and kind of like in the public consciousness, the growth in historic alpha prices. I mean, I think, and this is kind of, I wouldn't expect everybody to be up on this stuff, but you, you kind of see, it especially happened with Jaguar, and it's starting to happen, I think, a little bit with alpha, but some of the more recent cars, which weren't considered to be as collectible perhaps uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, as this kind of process has ramped back up and as alpha has kind of, started to seem like a real brand in the States again. We've seen some people kind of looking back at, at some of those later alphas, I think, and, and the interest in those cars has grown a little bit. Uh, I think that'll probably continue to happen as, as this brand rolls okay. out. And I think we saw it when we introduced, obviously, the 4C Coupe and the 4C Spider. Yeah. You know, when we brought it to market, there was a huge interest for Alfa Romeo coming. And to your point, if you take a look at now at uh, Alfa Romeo uh, 75s or Milano's, you yeah. know, those vehicles, obviously a rear-wheel drive sedan, mm -hmm. Julia spiked a lot of that interest as well, again, for that market. So, yeah, I mean, historic Al Alfa Romeo's always have been very strong vehicles, historical-wise, but, I mean, yes, it's only helped us uh, to grow that value as well. But, you know, to the gentleman's earlier post, obviously we have a Spider, which is obviously our 4C Spider, but um, I know the point he was going to, yeah. the yeah. <laughs> duetto comparison. In fact, uh, speaking of that, we've got Doc Wolf wanting to know uh, if a compact Giulietta is in the works and if that would ever come to the American market. So the Giulietta obviously is in the, in the market today in Europe. Um, if we just if we simply look at it from a growth and a volume perspective, that is a very, very small market for the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, currently, I mean, with, with both Stelvio and both Giulia, we're going after almost 50 percent of premium industry. So I can't go into future product, but as of now, um, you know, the, the market isn't there for us here. And, and Wright White wants to know it, how flexible the Julia platform is. Could there be a wagon version of it? 
So, um, you know, obviously it's a very flexible platform because we're building the, uh, the Julia and the Stelvio of it. And the whole Giorgio architecture, obviously, because of the large investment made, the whole goal was to have flexibility on there. Um, as of now, there's, there, uh, there's, not, there's no wagon version of the Julia. Okay. It's the Stelvio. Yeah, yeah. yeah there yeah. you go. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly the right way. Well, the, the plan when, when uh, Mr. Marchione first talked about the reintroduction of Alpha in the yeah. United States, the plan was a six-model lineup uh, to be introduced over the course of a couple of years. And as these things have, tend to do, the time frame has shifted a little bit farther out. But as I understand it, the you know, commitment is still to have uh, a family of uh, six distinct vehicles uh, on the market uh, by the end of 2020. Is, is that still the plan? Yeah, that is correct. That is the plan that was communicated by Mr. Marchioni. And uh, obviously, you know, we're launching the brand. We're building the car. The Giulio is the first car built of the Giorgio platform. So that car is introduced now, you know, Stelvio coming. So, yeah, we're working very hard towards introducing more vehicles where we see a market opportunity. And you spent how many billion, did you say, on the yeah, Giorgio? Five, five billion. Five, five billion. billion. Yeah. And, and, and do, with that sort of investment, it's, it must be a very flexible architecture Correct. that can be you know, applied to vehicles of, of a you know, fairly wide range of sizes and classes, I imagine. Correct, yep, and that was the, that was the important thing, correct? We were, de we were developing a, a, uniquely, a unique platform for Alfa Romeo and make sure it's a flexible platform so we can you know, obviously meet market demands globally for the vehicle as well, and then, you know, uh, go after the segments that uh, Alfa Romeo need to compete in. Hey, we've got uh, another phone call that came in. Carmen, let's bring that one in, too. Hi, guys. Uh, I had two questions on the Julia. Um, how much does it weigh relative to the European model, and is it uh, impossible that uh, we would ever get the manual? Like, maybe if it sells great, uh, would they be able to justify bringing it? Uh, Thanks a lot. Would love to hear the answer. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. So, um, in regards, let's uh, let's start with the manual question. You know, yeah, like, there's I, several I, other <laughs> that was people here. Right? <laughs> that was going to come, come sooner or later. <laughs> yeah. So, um, hey, the manual transmission obviously is offered in Europe on the on the Quattroforio version. Um, we decided not to introduce the manual in um, uh, in the in the North American market, and simply it's because the transmission performs very well. You know, it's a very good our automatic transmission. Apologize. ZF transmission performs very, very well in the vehicle. It shifts very quick. We actually have a manual mode on the, on the vehicle as well, so it will not up or downshift unless you trigger it to do so. So the performance, and obviously, you know, to go back to the Nuremberg uh, lab record, we set it at 7 minutes and 32 seconds. We, uh, we set it in an automatic transmission as well with uh, the paddle shifter. So um, as of now, we don't have a plan to bring the manual transmission to uh, North America. And, uh, you know, again, because the automatic transmission performs, uh, performs very well. To put it in perspective, it's actually a really small portion of the, of the uh, premium midsize sedan market. It's about, you know, 5%, depending on the competition, about 5 to 10%. So uh, let's, uh, you know, we focused on, uh, you know, having our best performance Julia Quad portfolio, and that was the automatic transmission that one performed the best. And then uh, in regards to weight, um, obviously the, the, the issue is with, when you look at weight of vehicles, we have different packaging in Europe than we do over here. You know, for example, there's different safety features, safety requirements in the vehicle. There's different standard equipment on the car. They're really, really close to each other, um, you know, within 50, 70 pounds of each other, depending on the trim level. We really obviously worked on keeping the car light. Uh, one of the features that we have on every Julia, for example, is a carbon fiber drive shaft that you normally only see in your high performance car to control the weight in the vehicle and to obviously maximize our uh, near 50-50 weight distribution. We really uh, uh, focus on you know, maximize or reducing the weight uh, as possible, but the weights are pretty close to me, uh, depending on what, whatever features you put in the car. Interesting you bring up the, the carbon fiber drive shaft because we put the car up on a hoist to look yep. underneath it. You can barely see the drive shaft. The, the underneath is so clean aerodynamically, but from <coughs> about the, the rear, rear wheel rearward, there's so much heat shielding there. And one of our viewers saw that, Joe Pastor. He says, how did you engineer those heat shields to prevent rattling? I don't know if that's the right question to ask to you, Peter. But So I, I have to rely on my uh, you know, uh, senior Ferrari engineers that we have in Modena, Italy. But uh, I wouldn't do justice answering that question, to be really honest with you. Obviously, it takes hours and hours and, and months of testing. That's as much I can say to it, because I, I wouldn't do it justice explaining how that happens. Yeah. So. But I got to tell you, you know, none of us spend a whole lot of time looking underneath exactly. the car, but it was very interesting to put this up on the hoist and take a look underneath it. I remember myself the first time I saw the car on a hoist, I'm like, oh, wow, there's like nothing here. It's, yeah. it's very clean. Obviously, it's all about aerodynamics and, you know, balancing that, uh, you know, aerodynamics is key to get to your performance numbers, obviously. Yeah. 
And you know, one cool feature too, where we're speaking about aerodynamics. I don't know if you have experienced the aero, the aero, the active uh, aero front splitter we have on the car as well. It's really cool. So when you go over 62 miles an hour in a Julia Quattrofolio, we actually have an uh, automatic spoiler that pushes the car down, increasing your downforce by 220 pounds. So that's another feature that is really cool, something unique to Alpha that we really put on a, on a production sedan. Listen, this is where advertising works. Right. Because the first time I was aware of that was in your TV ad. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, see? <laughs> it's amazing how much of that stuff, and as this kind of the war for the, the you know, these high performance, super high performance sedans, it's amazing how much of how much stuff that was supercar stuff in the late 90s or early 2000s is now on these, you know, and what's crazy to me is like the expectation for what a supercar is and like how you expect it to perform and how the the living experience or the experience of living with the car is versus what you expect out of a car like this. And to see some of that, like the, the flat bottom seat, the the heat shielding and all the, the carbon fiber drive shaft and all this all this stuff that was again just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. That was that was like supercar only or like the highest of the high end and, and the active aero stuff making its way into you know what is it's a four-door sedan like that's that's crazy to me but it, i guess that's the way progress has gone and i guess if you want to stay on top of that battle with the, the amgs and the bmws and i guess that's the uh everybody so keeps ramping right, it up right. every single year right. i think it's great yeah. Yeah. Yep. that's how the business should work well peter we're gonna have to wrap up the segment with you right now but i gotta tell you thanks so much for coming on the show very interesting we're all going to be watching alfa romeo globally but since you've been on the show we're especially going to watch what you do in north america thanks john and uh, mark and Corey. Rory, thanks it was, uh, it was a pleasure being here so uh let's hope you invite me back another time well we will <laughs> okay. that's a promise we'll bring definitely it. do that bring a stealthio yeah, 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 yeah. yeah deal so we're going to take a quick break right now we've got a lot more to talk about of news uh, that's been going on in the industry we'll be back in just a moment thank you this is 37 seconds in the auto line garage from beast to beastier, thanks to aluminum, 500 pounds lighter. Goodbye V8, but more horsepower, more torque, better fuel economy, and you've never heard a V6 sound this good. And better still, now it gets a 10 speed. A sumptuous interior makes everyday driving a dream. A sleeker body slices through the air. Can this really be a pickup truck? Torque on demand transfer case, super long suspension travel, big fat Fox shocks. It's Baja time, baby. Note to self, get a paper route, start a cookie sale, scrape up 50 grand, buy a Raptor. This has been 37 seconds in the Autoline Garage. We're back. Oh. <laughs> and for those of you that wondered, what the hell were you just watching there? That was our attempt to really come up with a new way of doing very quick car reviews, video car reviews, only 37 seconds long. We've got a bunch of them on our website and our YouTube channel. Check it out. I think you'll get a kick out of the way we're doing it. You know, everybody's attention span is a lot shorter <laughs> yeah. these days. Every, and, and it's because everyone's so damn busy these days. Yeah. So that's why we came up with this idea of, doing a car review in 37 seconds. And people thought, why 37? You know, because first we talked 60 seconds, then we thought, ah, 60, that's way too long. Then we thought 40 seconds, but uh, we like the alliteration of 37 seconds. Ah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> so, I like it too, works. We're doing that. <laughs> if you can't say it in 37 seconds, I mean, I mean what's the point, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You can't get it hey, all out there. You know, I do a lot of broadcast. 37 seconds is a long, long time, time. Let, me yeah. Tell you. Yeah. let me tell you. Yep. So, uh, yeah, what do you think? What are, what are Alpha's chances here? You know, I, I personally, I think, I grew up on the M car thing, the AMG thing, the, you know, a little bit the, the Audi thing. And it has become, I think it was alluded to a little bit, but it has become kind of expected. So I think, you know, people reach a certain stage and if they're enthusiasts, the M3 and the AMG, well, fantastic cars, Maybe been there, done little, that. Yeah, maybe it's a little obvious. I mean, this thing looks entirely different. It's got the great quadrifolio badge on the, the fender, and it, it's distinctive. It sounds incredible. I think, you know, this and, and the uh, the Jaguar stuff, if if I were in that position, I, it would be very hard for me not to take a flyer and say, you know, let's give it a shot and see. You made a really good point during the conversation with Peter that, you know, 
he's going after 35 to 45 year olds. Yeah. Yes. And you made the point that, hey, you never knew Alpha. You never saw Alpha right. dealership. You don't know that. So, yeah, there's a whole opportunity sure. here of people who don't remember the baggage of years past. Exactly. And I think that's that's obviously a great position to be in. And, you know, would you like to have the continuity and the heritage of an M or an AMG or whatever? Probably. That doesn't hurt them. But mm -hmm. to be able to tell a fresh news story with new cars that look entirely different. I, the one thing, you know, the Quadrifoglio, of course, is the sort of green four-leaf sure. clover that's on there. Quadrifoglio, four-leaf, that's yeah. what it means. But they got to tell the story somehow, because my wife came out to look at the car, and she goes, oh, an Irish car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Right>. DeLorean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and speaking of things like that, it, it is amazing to drive. And, and one thing that we didn't get around to talking about is the steering, which... Honestly, I think people can't believe, won't believe how good that steering is until they have driven it. Sure. It's like nothing else on the road. But but I think that they also have the opportunity to play up the sense of elegance and distinction of an Italian car, as opposed to you know every German car. You know you can get it in whatever shade of gray or black you want, mm. essentially. And, and they've they've got a different take on luxury, a different take on performance. Uh, you're and so that's right. it's important that they communicate that. No, I, I totally agree because you know the Italians have got they think out the whole touch mm -hmm. feely experience. So the owner's manual is beautifully done. Yeah. You know, the key fob even is well done. Not that the Germans don't either, but I don't but it's think... it's a different idea of what luxury yes. is. And yes. I think there's a sense of, at least from my perspective, a sense of seriousness from the Germans. That is a very German thing, in case you haven't met any Germans. That's a, a very German attribute. But in, in a while, I think that's very good and very appealing. The idea of a car that's fun and that is a little bit joyful and a little bit, you know, even even some of the uh, the way that cars put together, the uh, infotainment thing, the uh, steering wheel start button, it's just fun. Like, is yeah, that better? Right. Probably not, but it's fun. It's and different. It's, it's yeah. you know certainly exactly. different. It, no, but I agree with you. It's fun too. Yeah, and I think that's maybe that's something people are looking for. I, I think it certainly has caught my attention. Well, and I think they should consciously reach out to more women than they appear to be doing. Sure. Because it is, it, it, it's an elegant vehicle, and it's not a, a hammer pounding a nail like an AMG. Well, the Quadrifoglio, it, it, it's a man's car. It really is. I mean, the, the high bolstering on the seats and that, most women, I don't think I'll be in sex as saying that, most women, I don't think, are going to go for that. Stelvio, absolutely, once you get to the SUV, but... I, the Quadrifoglio I, is less than half, probably, of Julia sales. Also, probably. Yeah. So, right. I, I mean, the, the, you're I, just saying for the, reg I, the I, regular I, Julia. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, I just think that th they need to play that card. I was very surprised in the commercials that I've seen that they've got the uh, female narrator. They, they've got the picture of the you know woman in heels getting out of the vehicle, and then you, they pull back and she's getting out of the back seat of the vehicle. And I think, no, I think you want to tell women this is a car that they want to be in charge of. And I, I think yep. that's more and more the you know I, something that we work. For very hard at is is not being exclusive and I think so much of the way these cars are talked about and marketed and traditionally have been thought about is this male dominated but you know my wife drives a GTI she she likes to go fast she likes to you know she she's probably every bit as good a driver as, as any of the male owners who own a, a GTI and I think if you if you only want performance cars to appeal to women or to men you're missing a, a tremendous amount of opportunity. And I, I, I think this car especially, you know, my wife was in love with this car um, when I brought it home. But And I think the same things that appeal to men with it are appealing to women, the performance and the styling. And yeah. and you're not going to out-German the Germans. No, Jesus. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Don't they, even start, they've yeah. got it Don't pretty even, much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's a, very, that's a very good point. I think, you know, if, if you... And we've seen that happen. We've seen other automakers attempt to do that and it is an uphill battle and it, and it absolutely they will bleed you of every dime you have uh, with Nürburgring testing and everything else so I I think it's it's very very smart to say what can we do differently what can we uh, I, you know obviously the question that we have to get over this Italian reputation for for service and reliability and the Chrysler reputation I mean exactly. that's the thing that worries me right. I mean this is a gorgeous car and it deserves to do well based mm -hmm. on the looks the value the the performance 
but everything that Fiat Chrysler builds is in the bottom, all their four brands are, are in the bottom five, or their five are in the bottom six, I forget, of, of the whole industry. Yeah. Alfa Romeo can't afford to do that. No, and it sounds like, you know, to hear them talk about it, it sounds like they're taking the right steps, and I mean, this is the kind of thing, time will tell, and I, I tell people who ask me, should I buy this or an M car, or should I buy a, a 4C a year ago, people were asking me, should I buy a 4C, or, and I can't offer a guarantee that anything is going to work out a certain way, but from my perspective, if you don't take a flight, if you don't try something, you you kind of disincentivize car makers from making interesting cars. You disincentivize uh, FCA from trying something like this. And from my perspective, as a, as an enthusiast, I think it's we're much better. The the variety is good for for us. It allows us to make more car enthusiasts. It allows us to make to reach people, you know, to my point earlier about women, that maybe you weren't reaching before with other... So, as, as someone who wants this family of car enthusiasts to be as big as possible, both personally and professionally, I think we got we got to give people the benefit of the doubt and and let them try some, some crazy stuff. Let them try, you know, that 4C is insane. I mean, that that is a car... I would never in a million years have expected a major automaker to, to try to sell in the United States. It's nuts. But here we are, and I, I think that's great. I mean, I think it's it's good for enthusiasts. It's good for for uh, for the business. So I don't know. I I, I really really hope um, people who are inclined to give these guys a shot do it and, and try it out. I think they'll get their shot. I really yeah. do. Yeah. So, but to your point, Myrick, now it's up to them to to execute, uh, to make absolutely. sure the cars are absolutely. reliable. Right. Yeah. Hey, a lot of other stuff going on this week, especially from Geneva. And what caught your eyes there? So, well, obviously the thing, Geneva, speaking of things that are insane, Geneva, I think we had a guy, uh, Jeff Vitrano, J.P. Vitrano, who's been with us forever, and he said he counted 12 automakers there that he had never heard of before. <laughs> <laughs> All making million dollar, multi million dollar supercar. Right. That talk about that's fantastic. Like he said, yeah, you've got the more mainstream guys over at uh, Koenigsegg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Pagani. Yeah. Yeah. But that's yeah. fantastic. I mean, that that uh, you know, I don't know how many of these people are are billionaires with money to burn and will never make a business or sell a car. I I don't know, but. It certainly is fun to see, and it's a little bit old school, right? Like, we don't see cool concepts. Well, and, and it's the place where the far-out European small design houses yeah. show their stuff also. And the really wild stuff that they, they bring out to the show may never get built, but it's their business card to help them get Absolutely. work from, from other companies on production vehicles. Yeah, absolutely. But there were quite a few concept cars there. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, it's good to see that there are still concept cars. And what, Geneva's the place to do it. What'd you guys make of uh, Volkswagen's toaster on wheels? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, I mean, Volkswagen... Um, Here, we got a picture of it up on the screen. <laughs> good Lord. For people who thought that the microbus was too attractive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think there's a lot of activity, obviously, around this kind of mobility solution type vehicle. I don't know how realistic this is. Um, it's fun to speculate, though. It's fun to think about, you know, what is what is this? But look at that front end. I mean, it's it looks kinda like, cute you know, in a way. Cute? I don't know. It looks like somebody <laughs> just slapped it in the face with a two by four. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look happy. I think it looks like it's sticking his tongue out. It at does you. exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. But, but it smacked it in the face, and it's sort but, of dazed. But in a world uh, of autonomous vehicles, give yeah. them credit. That would be the perfect airport shuttle. Yeah. I mean, th there's a place where that would make sense, and they are trying so desperately hard to shift the conversation about technology from diesel emissions to anything else. Yeah. That you know, they're just spinning off ideas at, at a crazy pace, and they're not all going to be great ideas. But you know, give them credit; they've got ideas at least. And it has been fun. I mean, it has been fun seeing them. You know, I'm sure it's not fun for them. I'm sure <laughs> inside the boardroom, it's not as much fun. But seeing that some of the concepts we've seen in Detroit and uh, Frankfurt last year, and and this thing, it, it, that's it, it's a little bit whimsical, and it's a little bit trying to you know de evilify the Volkswagen brand now after after everything that's happened. Well, and at their at their most popular in the U.S., they were a brand that people associated with whimsy, the the, sure. the bug yeah, yeah. and the microbus. Yeah. If they could figure out a way to get back to that, that could work for them. Absolutely, and, you know, nothing else really has. Yeah. That's right. So let's see what else. AMG GT. Oh, let me go. For, let me take that one. Okay, yeah. go ahead. I Mark. am so baffled by what Mercedes is doing with their brand structure. It seems like every step that they make is, you know, reducing the value of the basic Mercedes brand, which 
for most of the last 120 years has been the greatest brand in the world if you buy a car. And now there's Mercedes AMG and there's Mercedes Maybach and, and there's 50 different flavors of everything. And why does the AMG, why does AMG need to be a brand? Why does it need to have a separate, how many vehicles are there now that they call GT? Is it up to four? No, it's at least three different variations. Of I hadn't it. thought of that. I, it's, I, I think that they're really, you know, they're telling their customers, oh, yeah, you bought a Mercedes, but you could have done better on the one hand. And they're making it too hard to keep straight what they actually are offering. I think some of that stuff, you know, with bringing the E and the, uh, the, the letter nomenclature from uh, getting that in line from the sedans to the SUVs has made some sense. Uh, Absolutely. But, you know... It, this is kind of, uh, you know, things are going very well at Mercedes right now. And I think there's there's a little bit of exuberance there and a little bit of expansion. Who, You know, we will know very soon if it's overreaching. You know, if if this doesn't work, then we'll, we'll be able to say it's, it's overreaching. But I think the AMG thing, it's tough. They have, you know, AMG um, started off as a tuning operation and, and, you know, contributed a lot on the motorsports side and obviously – has been built into a, a great badge and contributed tons of money over the absolutely, years. Absolutely, 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 and huge profit. A great there. known brand, I think. Um, but I, I wonder how much, um, how much I think Mercedes struggles to. I think their perception of AMG is probably a little bit different than the public's perception. I think the public ties AMG much more closely to Mercedes, and to me, it's felt like in the last couple of years. Mercedes is trying to make the case that this really is us. This really is our performance line. This is our M. This is our, you know, rather than, than I think maybe that origin story of it being a tuning house kind of sits in the back of people's mind at, at Mercedes, and they think we have to make and, this. And that, that's fine, but why then are, are they, it, it seems to me that by making it a separate right. brand than just making it, it worse, M, yeah. they, they make it worse, and they sort of devalue the appearance right. of performance aspirations for the rest of the Mercedes. Yeah. Just like the, the existence of a Maybach devalues the rest of the S-Class yes, class. a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't, and they, they will tell you, I'm sure they would tell you they're reaching a different customer. You know, yes. this is a different, a different thing. And they will also tell you that, you know, they're going to sell every Maybach that they make, which I think is, is probably true. They told us the first time they brought Maybach. <laughs> right, <out. laughs> right. So we'll see. I but, think, and, yeah. and speaking of, and they won't make many of these, thank God, but speaking of, of, of Maybachs and limited aspirations, the G650 Landau oh, Lesh, no, the, the $500,000 soft top that's perfect. Jeep Wrangler. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's perfect. A wonderful car. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone should have a car like that. Yeah. It should all be like that. I, I think, see, this is, from my perspective, just living in a world where that car exists makes me feel good. Like that. <laughs> that, that is, yeah. <laughs> that's, that, and, and also, like, it's a great indicator of, like, how strong Mercedes feels right now. Because if times were lean, they would not be trying to... to that, that is the crazy stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, you know, I'm a huge G-Class. Like, how cool is a car that's been... Almost entirely unchanged for what forty forty some years now. That's awesome to me. <laughs> and then to, and then to say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna put a nicer interior in it. We're gonna make it a, a land a lot, and we're gonna sell it for half a million dollars. And you're gonna buy them. That to me, yep. that's great. That's pretty gutsy. Yeah. Yes. Is right. it tasteful? <laughs> maybe maybe not quite as much. Yeah. Well, taste is in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Hey, look, we got to take another quick question. We got a lot more to talk sure. about on uh, on Geneva, but Carmen, let's give a good. Shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. Okay, we're back. I'm talking about Geneva right now. Of course, one of the things about the AMG GT concept, because remember as a concept, is they're hinting that it's going to be electric. Oh, wow, yeah. And and let's see, there's another... The I mean, Bentley, that, Bentley. Is, that, is that a headline yeah. anymore? We're going to do, we're going to electrify this as well, or does it just mean it's a car? Well, here's what I want to know. Tesla has scared the hell out of the Germans because it's come out of nowhere and it does very, very well in the expensive full-size sedan segment. They got to respond to it. But I'm not sure that that segment is going to grow much at all. Yeah, you got China and growth yeah. in the world, but now you're going to have everybody and their brother jump into that yeah. segment. And I don't think the segment's going to grow that much. You're just going to slice it up thinner for everyone. Yeah, and I, I also don't know if, if Tesla customers are potential uh, other electric car customers. I think that you're selling to a very specific type of person who buys a Tesla, and they're into Tesla. 
you know what I mean? They're they're not necessarily into into electric cars generally. Um, but and I think to your point, maybe that's not a headline anymore. Maybe, but I think the interesting thing is with this concept stuff, we're starting to see automakers make a case for electric performance cars. So that's a different thing. So and, and here we just got another picture. This is the the Bentley EXP 126E. I think I got that right. Yeah, some like going that by by memory here. It's got to have a V12. I mean, let's be honest. Like, oh, okay. Cars, yeah, <laughs> or a straight six. I mean, or a straight four would be even better. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, but yeah, I think I think they're trying to make a case. I think they're trying to say, let's start thinking about electric cars a little bit differently. And you know, well, and, and and the technology is a natural for performance. Sure. Uh, they they have to you know obviously continue to address affordability and, and you know particularly range and, and battery. But I mean, I think it's reasonable to figure that that will get better because that's what technology does. Sure. Uh, so I think I think there will be more of them going forward. Um, there Whether will be. they're getting ahead of their skis is a good question. Well, that, yeah. that, that's a good way to put it, too, because, look, you know, the electric thing is really cool. I mean, from a performance standpoint, it, it's fantastic. But, you know, Tesla bleeds red ink. Right. Now, they're growing so fast, the investment community doesn't care. Right. You know, they just look at the top line, not the bottom line. They don't care about sure. the bottom line, at least not now. But other major automakers, can't they can't get away with that. No. You can't call, hey, look, we've put a billion dollars into this car that's <laughs> yeah. never going to make a penny. Yeah. Well, and, and BMW, they launched the iElectric uh, you know, sub-brand with such fanfare a couple of years ago. And they looked at the sales numbers and they said, yeah, we're not going to do any more iModels for a while. We're going to concentrate on doing plug-in and hybridized versions mm -hmm. of all of our others. They other got stuff. ahead of their skis, yeah. to use your terminology, <laughs> because who... Who wants to buy an 80 mile range or what are they what are they got it up to oh. now? 120 or something? Yeah, that was it's, a, the know. market's not ready for that kind of limited range. Well, and I think that the that's Tesla right. thing is uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, especially not when you can get a 238 mile range for less money. Sure. Right. I mean, I, I, I think Chevy has completely screwed the business case for a lot of other people's electric vehicles That'll be interesting. for the next couple of years. That'll be very interesting. Yeah. And I, I think, so right now you have the Tesla thing, which is like these early adopters, these people who are Tesla fans, who who are willing to excuse any, you know, from both from an investment standpoint and from an owner standpoint. I mean, the, let's be honest, the, the owner experience of a Tesla owner is not... GM can't get away with that experience, or, or Mercedes can't get away with that. Really, experience. Tesla cannot with the Model 3. Right. And the Model 3 is the acid test. If they can launch that successfully, then they may have a chance. They're, and if they can launch it successfully, and, and at some point you start to see where they're starting to make money, yeah. wow, yeah. they've changed the industry. And, yes. and that's the big question. I mean, And I think right now, you know, we the Model S was a bit of an acid test, too. And, and through that whole thing, you know, as I was, can we convince people to give us more money to keep doing this? And I think that's what happened. But I, boy, it's it'll be interesting, like like you said, and like we've all been saying, I guess, is um, can we compete with a real automaker? So right now, they're they're serving a boutique uh, buyer, and they're doing it on on borrowed money um, or donated money, but to compete with a GM, to compete with a Mercedes, that is an entirely different business. And it'll be very, very interesting to see how, how they get there. And it'll be very interesting to see if Mercedes and Chevy and everybody else don't say, oh, we can do this and we can do it way better. Thanks for, thanks for everything you've done getting this into the public eye, but uh, we'll, we'll take it from here. Thanks. And by a year from now, we'll have a pretty good indication sure. of whether they were able to do it, Sure. which is going to make the next year beyond fascinating. It will be. And, you know, then at the top end of the market, we've got companies like Faraday Future and uh, what's the other one I'm blanking out on right now? It, I, I don't know how many of these are ever going to. Yeah, I, I, well, yeah. You might I, not have to remember. I've, them honestly, them. <laughs> I've honestly stopped trying to remember a lot of their names. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be I, and I know what you're talking about. I can't remember the name of it either. There, Like you said, there have been so many of them, but it, it'll be. Man, being a, a car startup is not like being a, a even you know, other hardware startups. You know, the the guys who build cell phones, the guy who who builds uh, the Nest Cam or what are any of these different pieces of technology. It is very different to make something that um, may or may not work in someone's home, may or may not work as a cell phone. But it, it, uh, there is a lot tied up in building a car as far as um, regulatory and as far as what what the consumer expects to buy something that costs. You know, starting off at twenty-five thousand dollars and going all the way up, um, 
It's I would not if I if I was a, a Silicon Valley tech billionaire looking to spend some money, that is not the place that I would want to spend it. But God bless them. I guess they. Uh, <laughs> they and they they've are. made the industry more fun for us to to, sure. to watch and write about and study. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk about fun watching the industry. I mean, here's a story that's just blown so fast. Opal getting dumped by General Motors. Mark, what, what do you make? I, uh, I think it was time. You know, honestly, I mean, you know, eight years ago during the the you know Great Recession, when Opal you know w was almost forced to sell Opal, I th sorry, when GM was almost forced to sell Opal, I thought that would have been a, a mistake because GM needed the engineering resources, they needed the scale they got out of China. Now, eight years later, they're still losing money. They've built up the rest of their, their resources around the rest of the world. It 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 was time to fish or cut bait, and you know, Peugeot has been successful in different businesses before. You know, I, I, I wish them the best, but uh, I think it was you know, absolutely the thing to do. And uh, now, we, now we get to watch to see you know, who made the right bet with their money. Yeah. And I think it's certainly at this point, uh, Opal is more useful to Peugeot than it is to GM at this point. I think um, you know, years ago when, when the Opal brand name was probably more rec recognizable in, in Germany and Europe, um, than say a Chevy, or as we get more and more global, that problem is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, and, and they had damaged a lot of the yeah. uh, value right. of the Opal <laughs> right. you know, brand name. They were making it more years. valuable, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was a depreciating asset. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I think it's smart on GM's, uh, you know, we'll see if it was smart for, for Peugeot, but it definitely, I think, um, focusing on making a Chevy uh, global brand makes a, a lot of sense. I don't, I don't know why you would do it another way. Well, and, and it puts greater importance on the engineering and design centers in China and Korea. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because they have to pick up the slack on, on vehicles you know, where Opel had, had had the lead. And that becomes a huge challenge and, a, and an, a, an existential you know, challenge, really, for GM. I mean, are they ready? Mm -hmm. But, you know, Europe is either the second or third largest market in the world. You know, sure. China, number one. I think you uh, are NAFTA. Let's call it NAFTA, number yeah. two. Europe, number three, though it probably varies between NAFTA and Europe. Can you, as a major automaker in the world, walk away from one of the biggest markets there are? We're going to find out. I, I mean, th their argument is we can walk away if it's a very, very high cost, very, very low margin mm -hmm. place, and we can you know, get a better return on the investment in others. I, I hear that argument we'll and I go, out. yeah, but Ford's making a billion dollar profit yeah. Yeah. in Europe. Yeah. Re read my column on Sunday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this coming Sunday? Yeah. This coming Sunday. I've spent some time talking because it is interesting because Ford faced the same challenges. They were losing money, not at the same rate, and they had a record, uh, all-time record profit in Europe last year of $1.2 billion right. at the exact same time the GM was saying, who can we unload this dog on? Right. And thereby hangs a tail. Yeah, but, boy, uh, does it. And I think there, there is something to be said, though, for that global Ford brand. Ford in Europe is Ford in the United States, is Ford in China, is Ford every, and GM, I think it, it, the, the, smart, the smart thing, I, again, is we have this brand that we're spending billions of dollars to promote worldwide. We're gonna, we're gonna Chevy, it's gonna be Chevy in China, it's gonna be Chevy. I, I don't think Opal, the Opal name is, is valuable to them as so the Chevy. So what do you think, Rory, would GM go back to Europe with the Chevy brand? I would think they'd have to. I mean, what do you think, Mark? You can't be out of it forever. You can't, no. I, I think they, they'll be there as, as a tiny niche player for a while, but, but I feel that they will at some point try to sell meaningful numbers of cars. You have or, or do you go back as Maven and Lyft? I, I think you have to. I mean, Chevy is, Chevy is Coca-Cola. Chevy yeah. is, I mean, Nike. It's, it is a globally recognized You could brand. go back as Maven and Lyft using Chevy yeah. vehicles. But that bow tie... And which is what basically Wait, Peugeot wants to do. You go America. back with Chevy Bolts, the yeah. Bolt EV. Yeah, I right. mean, you know, yeah. that's going to be autonomous, and uh, yeah. you know, that, that's what. So I mean, those, I, those I read two some quote. Services. Somebody said that GM would not pull out of Europe unless it had something in its back pocket right. about how they were going to get back, back in again. Yeah, and that sense. that made a lot of sense to me. Yeah, you have to. I mean, that's just a lot of money yeah. to leave on the table, and it's a lot of market share and a lot of awareness and a lot of other stuff. I mean, and just sheer volume. Yeah. I, I mean, the idea that after, for the first time in our lives or our parents or in some cases our grandparents' lives, GM will not be in the conversation about who's the biggest car company in the world. Mm -hmm. 
well, they're not. I mean, the, the dumping Opal will knock that, them down to saying. either number four or five. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. who'd have thought that? GM being maybe the, only the fifth largest yeah. in the world. And a million and a half out of first place, you know, at, at least. So, I mean, the, the, the last few years it's been, oh, I wonder who's going to you know, finish. All three close enough that it doesn't matter. You know, if, if it matters, there's no question. You're right, GM's number five or so now. I, I agree with them that, hey, look, at the end of the day, it's about making money. Yeah. It's not about saying I'm the biggest. It's about right. saying I, I got more money than you do. Right. And so invest in me. But to me, what GM is doing is very short-term focused. Oh, we're, we can't make money in Russia? Bail out of Russia. Mm -hmm. We can't make money in Europe? Bail out of Europe. We can't make money in Indonesia? Get out of Indonesia. We can't afford making cars in Australia? Get out of Australia. I understand it, but it's very short term, and this is a cyclical industry. Yeah. And for example, a Russia, Ford's sticking to it, and I don't want to keep coming back to Ford, but they're the crosstown rival, they're a good comparison. One day the Russian market's going to turn and go back to being what everybody knew it was going to be, mm -hmm. it's going to be a big market. And to say, oh, we'll get back in, you, you, it's, you, no way you're going to get back with the other guys. Yeah. But, but historically, there's not that big a, a penalty for being later in as opposed to being first. There, you, you, the, the, the first players into markets don't usually get that big and long term. I'm not term sure, sure I would agree. You know, one of the reasons why Buick is so successful in China is it was one of the first ones yeah. in there. One of the first ones. One of the, the Volkswagen is yes. doing okay there, too. And, and exactly. Volkswagen, yeah. too, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think, so that's the bet, right? If you're Chevy, that's the bet, is we'll be able to get in there, get scaled up, and start start moving cars again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Opel hadn't been selling uh, vehicles uh, in, well, in, in Russia for a while. It was Chevy that they shut down there. But I, I, I suspect that Chevy will be back in Russia before it's back in the rest of Europe. Would Opel be back in the United States? That's a fascinating question. Reading between the lines of what Peugeot CEO Carlos Tavares was saying, I felt like he thought that the Peugeot brand might have a better shot in some new... Well, he didn't have Opel at the time, right? right? No, 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 <laughs> this, no, this was what he was saying this okay. week. You know, because we, we we asked the question about Opel coming into other uh, you know markets and, and getting growth there, and he made it very clear that the focus was for to help Opel to have Opel help them get into markets and get customers that they could not get in Europe, more than being an entree into other parts of the world. So maybe it'll come back, Very but I would not rule out Peugeot either. Mm -hmm. Well, Peugeot, uh, they've already announced they're doing some sort of uh, right. ride sharing in what, yep. San Francisco or someplace like that? Yeah, I, 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 a couple I of East and West Coast right. places. So they, they so are like trying we to put... we were talking about with, you know, will GM get back into Europe with Maven and Lyft? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, we were talking about like which one carries more brand cash in the United States, Opel or Peugeot, it's like, Boy, I, that's like it's six to one half dozen. Well, yeah. you know, my guess is, and and you know we're nitpicking stuff yeah. here, right? How many angels can dance on the head of a pen, <laughs> right. kind of a thing? But I think Opal's probably got better name recognition. Just I mean, people don't even know how to spell Peugeot. Yeah. Number one, and, and the good, and I think Opal's best you know asset is that it's easy for Americans to pronounce. Yeah, it is. You know, yeah. and Peugeot and Citroen, no, no, right? But you know, people. Some people at least remember the Opel GT, yeah. which was a cool little car, sure, and yeah. the Opel Manta, which was a terrific sedan, actually, yeah. for what it was. And I, I think probably Peugeot has sold more nameplates in the United States, though, than... Yeah, but they're bicycles. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I used to have a Peugeot. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Ten speeds, <laughs> racing <laughs> handlebars. It was great. Yeah. Hey, look, we got to wrap it up, but uh, this has been terrific. Roy, great having you on the show, man. Thank you. This Thank is you. great. We're, we got to have you back. And Mark, you. you're a regular anyway. Thank we're we're going to keep that going, too. <laughs> and I loved having uh, Peter Hogaveen here, too, from Alpha. I thought that was really good. Yeah, I'd be interested to talk to him again. Yeah. Another six man, months. And it's nice to have an Alpha you know, here in the studio. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Better to have it out on the road today. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're wrapping it up. Thanks, all of you, you, for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.